Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Memorial Presbyterian Church, a church in the heart of the community with the community at heart. The Lord be with you. Please stand if you're able. Let us join in the responsive call to worship. We give you thanks, O Lord. We sing your praise. We give thanks for your steadfast love. We give thanks for your faithfulness to us. Your steadfast love endures forever. Please remain standing. Let us bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, give us such a vision of your purpose and such an assurance of your love and power that we may ever hold fast the hope which is in Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And all God's people said together, Amen. If we say that we have no sin, then the truth is not in us, and we are only deceiving ourselves. But if we confess our sin, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in penitence and in faith, let us confess our sin before Almighty God, first together as one body, and then silently as individuals. Let us pray. God of compassion, in the cross of Jesus Christ, you reveal the nature of your love. But we turn away, distracted by our own agendas. We confess that we try to keep you in a box of our own making. Forgive our desire to control you and your ways, thinking that we know best. Grant us greater wisdom and faith to follow where your spirit leads. Amen. 
In Jesus Christ, God rescued us, not because of any good works that we have done, but according to God's mercy. People of God, rejoice. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, we also ought to forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please take a moment and pass the peace to your neighbor. It's really wonderful to see the people of God sharing God's peace with one another. So we certainly pray for peace among yourselves and around the world where there is places, there are places of conflict. Call your attention to the golden rod insert in the bulletin this morning. Draw your attention to a few of the special announcements. First of all, you'll note that the Hunter Camp family is on vacation. That's one reason why I'm at the pulpit this morning. <laughs> and uh, Hunter put me in charge of the pastoral work while he is gone. So I told the congregation this morning in the first service, I've been rather busy as I had four uh, visits to make this week. So, uh, But if anybody has any special needs, please don't hesitate to ask. We're here to serve you and certainly pray for your uh, well-being. We also pray that the Hunter and Amy and William are having a great vacation. It's much deserved. And we certainly pray for their safety and their enjoyment. Please sign the uh, friendship, a ritual of friendship pad you'll find at the end of each row. And uh, give us your name and address on any other pertinent information you'd like to share. And along those lines, if you wish to join our congregation, we're having a series of new member orientation classes starting in July 8th. You'll see the announcement regarding that. If you'd like to attend those meetings, please indicate your interest on the sheet this morning. And also by calling the church office and making a reservation uh, to attend that first session on July 8th. This afternoon, the Apex Younger Families are having a beach gathering, so we pray for their good weather this afternoon, and all the Apex folks will come out and join in fellowship there. At this time, we're going to have the children's moment, and Susan Connor, I understand, is going to be doing the honors this morning. So all the children of the congregation are invited to come forward. Good morning, good morning. I know there's, a, there's at least one. <laughs> the young and the young at heart. Many, <laughs> if any of the young at heart want to come up here, just Anyone <laughs> else? Us, you're welcome to Come do on that. down. Come on down. It's lo lonely up here. It's just me. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, boys, for joining me up here. So, have you ever played a game called King of the Mountain? <laughs> Never played King of the Mountain? Well, let's hear, Joey, you and I will tell. Um, what King of the Mountain. So King of the Mountain is a game where one person gets to be the king and you stand on either maybe a mound of sand or a bench or a stack of pillows and then the other kids who are playing try to knock you off. It's, it's fun, sort of, but uh, well in today's, I thought I would just start with that to put us in the right frame of mind for today's Bible lesson which is about Jesus as our king, as king being sent here to live with us on earth as our king. Well, in the book of John, the story goes, Pilate is questioning Jesus. You know, why are you king? And Jesus says, I, I wasn't, I'm not elected king. I'm not here to make laws or to govern you. I'm not gonna raise your taxes. I am here as your king of love, as king of truth, and as king of faith. 
faith in God. So I'm here to lead you like that. But just like in the game King of the Mountain, Pilate knocks Jesus down, knocks him off of his, his, his mountain. Uh, but as we know, Jesus was sent here by God to show us that we are all loved by God and forgiven by God. And we are so grateful for that. So let's bow our heads. We'll close with a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for sending us Jesus to teach us and help us learn and follow you. Help us to be patient and kind and love one another. And all God's children say, amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Our first lesson today is from 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 20, and 11, 14 through 15. Then all the elders of, of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt this day to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, Listen to their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots, and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers, he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no. But we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our 
Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 40. Hear now the word of the Lord. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again and again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Imagine how Samuel must have felt as he found himself squarely in the middle between the people of Israel and Almighty God. The Old Testament lesson this morning depicts that very clearly. On the one hand, the people were clamoring for a king who would go out and fight battles for them against the Philistines on the west and the Ammonites on the east. There were many local tribes who had kings as well. Now we're talking ancient history here, somewhere in the 1000 BC period, that's a long time ago. Samuel was both a prophet and a judge in Israel. It was during the time in which judges exercised influence over the various regions in Israel, but the people felt there was chaos in the land because the, the prophets or the, <clears throat> the rulers of the regions didn't have any coordination and things were all going in different directions. Now Samuel, you may remember, felt the call to service when he was just a 12-year-old boy, learning under the tutelage of Eli, the priest. You may remember that story. Eli was in the priest of the, of the temple, and he was one night laying down to go to sleep in the temple, and Samuel was, living, was sleeping in another room across the way. So they went to sleep, and then uh, Samuel was awakened when he heard this voice calling out, Samuel, Samuel. So he got up, and he thought Eli was calling him. So he went over to Eli and woke up the old priest and said, Sir, did you call me? He said, No, I didn't call you. Samuel, well, go back and lie down and go to sleep. So he went back and laid down to sleep once again. A little time went by, and then Samuel heard the voice again. Samuel, Samuel. So Samuel gets up again, goes over to Eli, the priest, taps him on the shoulder, wakes him up. He said, what is it you want this time, boy? He said, I heard that voice again. He said, boy, are you imagining something or what? Now, don't, don't disturb me again. Just go back and lie down and go to sleep. Eli went to sleep. Samuel went back over to the room where he was staying, went to sleep. Then he lay down for a little while, and he heard that voice again. Samuel, Samuel, it was even stronger than the first time. So Samuel woke up, he got up and said, to himself, should I go over and wake up Eli once again? I guess I better. I think he's calling me th really this time. So he went over there and he woke him up and he said, Sir, did you call me? And he said, No, I did not. But then it says that Eli realized that God was calling Samuel. God was calling him. Samuel, Samuel. Now here was Samuel, much older, and two of his sons were judges who were corrupt and accepted bribes. Discording justice in their respective regions. On the one hand,
hand, the people were demanding a king. And God said, listen to the voice of the people. They have rejected me as their king. They have not rejected you because Samuel said, they're not listening to me anymore. They're rebelling against me. But God said, they're not rebelling against you. They're rebelling against me. So give them what they want. Give them a king. But Samuel said, Lord, are you going to give in to them? He said, just do what I say. Let them have a king. The scripture points out all the things that the king is going to be doing. Those this long list of things he's going to do. He's going to take people from the populace and make them soldiers. He's going to have great large fields he'll, and he'll acquire land from the people. And he'll take the women to be slaves and servants and all the rest, all those kinds of things. Got done with that long list. And Samuel said, now do you still want a king? They said, yes, we demand a king. He said, all right, you'll have your king. So they went, and he went to a place. And there he anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. And they said the reason why they chose Saul were two reasons. One was he was taller than any of the other men. He stood about a head taller than all the other men. That was one reason why they anointed him. Secondly, the scripture says he was handsome. So he was tall and he was handsome. I guess that made him a fit... <laughs> Uh, a candidate to be king. Is that true for the rest of us men? I don't know if that's true. Anyway, Saul was then anointed to be king. He got off to a good start, but if you remember the story in the Bible, he was not very successful at all. In fact, he didn't have much success. In fact, he, when uh, David was coming up, and David had that episode, that battle with uh, Goliath, and uh, killed him with his, with his uh, fling, then Saul, it said Saul became insanely jealous of David. So jealous of him, he tried to kill him. He chased David out in the country, and David was hiding in the caves. So Saul was besought with his jealousy the rest of his life. And finally, in the battle that Saul was carrying out, he died. And he fell on his own sword. His own sword pierced himself, and he died. And after that, David was anointed, and was anointed king over Israel. And most Jews considered David to be the most effective and most popular our history because he did consolidate all these different tribal regions, brought them all together, and he made Israel a strong nation. He went out and did fought battles for them. He was a great battler and a great administrator. Besides that, he was a poet and a musician, a multi-talented man. David certainly was, and many of the Psalms in the Old Testament, you know, are attributed to David. And Solomon, his son, followed him to be a king, and also under Solomon, Solomon was extremely wealthy also, the scripture says, a very wise man as well. This story about Samuel is somewhat similar to how Moses must have felt when God called him to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And as soon as they were out in the wilderness, what did they do? They turned against Moses, murmuring against him because of the hardship they had to endure. Now here they had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. But then they got out there in the wilderness... They didn't have very much to eat. They had nothing much to drink. They started murmuring against Moses, murmuring against God. So I'm sure Moses felt somewhat the same way as Samuel did. That's one of the trials and tribulations of being a leader. You know, sometimes a leader has to take a lot of criticism. You know, they can't please everybody all the time. So if you decide to do one thing, then the other side says, well, he's not doing this or he's not doing that. So it's not easy to be a leader. And Samuel found that out. And in Moses as well. There aren't many kings left in our modern world, and where there are, many of them hold just ceremonial positions with power and governments exercised by prime ministers or others who are elected officials. We in America recently enjoyed, I think, being drawn into the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. How many of you watched the wedding? Anybody watch it? Hold up your hands. Anybody get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to watch the wedding? You did? <laughs> Good for you. I didn't do that. <laughs> I guess I saw the rerun of it. It was a beautiful wedding, and there's something about, uh, at least it seems to me, there's something enchanting about the royal wedding. There's such pomp and circumstance. And in a way, it was a happy experience. There's so much sad news and bad news in the world today. It was nice to see something joyful. Would you agree? If you agree with that, just say amen. amen. Nice to see that. It was just nice to see it. So they're off to a good start in their marriage. 
Understand, though, that both William and Harry feel some sense of guilt at times because they don't work for a living. You know, all the centuries they've been simply there living, existing, and, and there's a sense of kind of an obligation they feel to give back to society because they have been receiving all this time. So there are some changes taking place in the uh, There was a family attending the first service today. I met them at the door. They said, we're from the UK. They said, we uh, certainly admired uh, the wedding greatly, but they look at it kind of skeptically as well. So they realize that they're more or less figureheads. They don't have any real authority over what is going on. In our scriptures today, now fast forward to the New Testament lesson, which describes the verbal exchange between Pontius Pilate and our Lord's betrayal and arrest. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priests were accusing Jesus of being a king. But our Lord said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate shot back, then you are a king. Jesus replied, you have said so. The priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees called out, we have no king but Caesar. Well, we all know what happened. All the authorities condemned Jesus, and they turned him over to be, and Pilate turned him over to be crucified. Pilate had Jesus flag, flogged, and then he died on the cross. He died for the sins of the whole world and for your sins and mine. Amen? That was a gift from God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen? So it was a terrible thing Jesus had to go through, all that suffering and punishment, but it was a great gift from God who loves us with an everlasting love. John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ began their preaching by saying, Repent! For the kingdom of God has drawn near. Jesus made a dramatic announcement of it when he stood up to read in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. He quoted the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To let the oppressed go free to proclaim the Lord's favor. This was not going to be a military or political messiah or king who would free Israel from domination of the Roman Empire, although, pe although the people were clamoring for release from the bondage. Disappointed many because he was not going to be that kind of king, and thus he also he kind of uh, upset some of his own disciples who were hoping that somehow he would go in that direction, especially Judas, who then he Messengers came from John the Baptist when he was in prison. They asked Jesus, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered the messengers, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. That is good news, is it not? That's what Jesus brought to the people. So Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of love ushered it in with his coming to the world in the flesh. It's exemplified by the Sermon on the Mount, and many of the good things that are in that passage. Today we see many damaged families in a broken society, but Jesus came to build the kingdom of God through the transformation of lives. Amen? Let's say it a little more resoundingly. Amen? There we go. Okay. We can help rebuild our neighborhoods by showing others they can find hope life in Jesus. All of us have something to do, so let us work side by side and do our part, whether big or small, to create a community of love for people that find Jesus Christ. Well then, how do you and I, citizens of his kingdom, help to make this invisible kingdom known to others? By practicing God's all-encompassing hospitality. We've been talking about that quite a bit in the church throughout this year. All-encompassing hospitality. Embracing all people, whoever they are, inviting them to Christ and to fellowship in the church and fellowship in God's kingdom. Now, friends, as you leave worship today and there is someone you don't know, introduce yourself and extend your friendship to them. As many of you know, I spent a lot of my time working with new members of the new members program in our church and we discovered that they have several reasons for joining this congregation. 
First one is they like the pastor, Hunter Camp. Secondly, they like the program of the church. Thirdly, they like the music of the church. And fourthly, and very importantly, they feel this is a friendly and welcoming congregation. So give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> I see Bill doing that out here, patting himself on the back. And I asked them, and they said that's one of the main reasons they joined this church. One person told me they visited six different churches in St. Augustine when they finally came to this one. One of the main reasons they came to this church was that they said four people spoke to them before they left the church that day. They said in other churches, nobody spoke to them. Not a single soul. They see, friends, take a moment to do that. And you can ask someone, are you a member or a visitor? You can say that. I do it all the time. If you're a visitor, make them sure you're welcome in this congregation. Many of you also are involved with ministries within the congregation, serving as officers, elders, deacons, and trustees. All of us can participate in the financial support of the congregation. We have a beautiful sanctuary here, don't we? Isn't that a beautiful place? Someone was telling me this morning, he comes in here every morning, he just admires it. such a beautiful place. Well, you know, we have this restructuring or this renovation program going on. It started with the cross being blown off the dome during a hurricane. And then the dome was damaged as well. Then we decided to do a hole outside of the church a lot of repair work and renovation. That's all beginning. So all of us can help in the overall ministry of the church by supporting it financially as well through this program that's beginning to help support all the cross and the dome. In addition, many of you are involved in service to others in the community and beyond. In addition, many of you are involved in service. Some examples are Stephen Ministers, Youth Mission Trips, St. Augustine Youth Services, so-and-so, is the food packing event held recently involving over 100 volunteers. That was a great event. All of these and many more help to spread the impact of God's kingdom of love. I suggest this prayer by Grenville Kleisner as our daily prayer. It says, if I can do some good today, if I can serve along life's way, if I can something helpful say, Lord, show me how. If I can right a human wrong, if I can help to make one strong, if I can cheer with smile or song, Lord, show me how. If I can aid one in distress, if I can make a burden less, if I can spread more happiness, Lord, show me how. And the classic prayer of St. Francis, which always has been one of my favorites, prays, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is envy, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. You and I can continue to pray the Lord's Prayer each week. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Indeed. Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed, which is printed in your bulletins. As one body, we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As I lead us in the prayers of the people today, I will offer a short prayer and then a time of silence, and then I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and then together we could say, hear our prayer, and I'll do that a number of times. So we'll have silence, Lord, in your mercy, and then together hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve your common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve them in Christ and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture reminds us that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So with grateful hearts, let us now give back to God with our tithes and offerings.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of all grace, we thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, for the joy that the ear may hear, for the unknown wonders of the universe. We thank you for sharing us in communities, for families, for friends, for companions at work, for strangers, and for children who offer us hope for the future. For all these blessings we give you thanks, loving God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. Amen. Friends in Jesus Christ, thank you for coming out to worship today. Our charge is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as your very own self. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today and throughout this week. All God's people once again said together, Amen. Amen.